roving cameraman. We're gonna make you walk. <laughs> Nice slider. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, okay. See, whenever he's ready. You guys, quiet. Okay. All right. If we don't end war, war will end us. H.G. Wells. He also has another thing that he mentions in the next slide here, which is not apparently working. Let's see. I think this is what happened to you, Steve, is the same thing. Yeah. So. With that said, no passion in the world is equal to the passion to alter someone else's draft. Every time I see an adult on a bicycle, I no longer despair for the future of the human race. For those who don't know about H.G. Wells, he's a famous, uh, prolific author, uh, did such great works as uh, War of the Worlds, I think you might have heard about it, and uh, of course, the, the Time Machine. And he was very much against war in pretty much all its forms. He was a person that believed in uh, the intelligence of the human race to overcome any conflict or problem, you know, through rational thought and uh, democracy. So for him, war was kind of an aspect of human culture that he really despised. He didn't enjoy uh, the violent nature of it, and he just he saw the effects of the First World War, and of course, just absolute tragedy. But uh, coincidentally, ironically, you might say, he was also one of the very first people to create the very first tabletop miniature war game called Little Wars back in 1913. And the whole idea came from, he was at a friend's house for dinner and he noticed that his friend's son had a bunch of these uh, different army men and toys like from the, the military toys and artillery pieces. And him and his friend, they were sitting there just talking, you know, uh, <laughs> understanding a bunch of the different conflicts that were going at the time. And for their fun, you know, free time, they decided, well, why don't we make rules to actually use these toys in an adult game? So they created one of the very first adult versions of a miniature war game, uh, uh, Little Wars, which you see H.G. Wells in the photo here. And these figures are uh, made out of lead originally, so not necessarily the best material to talk about when, uh, uh, when you're talking about safety for children, right, because lead is not a good thing for that, but uh, it was one of the very first examples of a war game being actually brought to the public attention. Uh, it was a published work and people could actually get a hold of it. Uh, over the next few years, now I'm going to kind of skip over a bit of history here because there's an entirely different industry that's called historical miniature tabletop games, and that's basically recreating events like the Napoleonic Wars, uh, World War I, World War II, etc. And that's a whole other topic that'll take you know at least an hour to talk about. So I'm gonna kind of cut and paste here. Essentially, the next area, and the most important thing to keep in mind, is a little company called Games Workshop. This was a picture taken in 1978 at the very first Games Workshop store. It doesn't exist anymore, that particular store, but uh, the company is very important for a lot of reasons. And for the most part, why Games Workshop is so influential is they started out as a company that produced miniatures for Dungeons and Dragons. They were kind of like a supplementary company that like, you need a bunch of spare orcs? Well, we can batch make them and you can buy like 20 orcs and uh, a variety of other things. But again, kind of like H.G. Wells, they realized, well, why don't we actually produce miniatures and rules and have our own universe and things and have people buy our product because you know we're making our own product, not because they're playing Dungeons and Dragons. So the very first product they made and is one of the more influential ones, which is coming up next, is Warhammer Fantasy Battles. This is a picture of like what some of the dioramas and pictures they would take. This is all newer stuff, of course. This is not the original miniatures that came out, but uh, definitely lots of changes have happened over the time. So an example, we have the first edition rule book, and then eight editions later, so 30 years of history for this one game. That's the current ver version, which is no longer continued as of this year, and that started in the 80s. So such a huge difference over those 30 years. But by far their most popular and probably their most well-known product is actually Warhammer 40,000. Now I'm going to kind of take a little bit of a detour here and say why this particular miniature game is the most influential in the world at the moment. It outsells every other miniature game almost uh, two-thirds to one. And there's a reason for that, but mostly it's the scale. Because keep in mind, people are about this big, and there's things that are 
astronomical insight. So when the Warhammer 40,000 takes place in the far future, about 40,000 years in our future, in the far future, and you have different dioramas of different alien races and uh, conflicts that are going on, basically the future is not a good place. It's actually quite a terrible place. And the scalability of the game is what I think pulls a lot of people into the hobby. You know, an average sized person about being this tall against these gigantic, pretty much over the top elements of you know, robots that are the size of entire cities walking around and actually being able to represent that on the tabletop. Which actually brings me to my biggest reason I think people enjoy tabletop miniature games is because with a video game you can see it and you can interact with things, but you're not really there, you're not in that location. With a tabletop miniature game, you're taking your imagination, a world that exists off, you know, you can't actually interact with them, you're taking those ideas and you're turning them into a physical thing. Like this thing, you could walk up to that, that's the size of a toddler, right? And those little guys down below are 28 millimeters, so about probably that big in size. And those are physical things you can move around, interact. It's just that whole tactile nature of it, I think, is why people keep coming back to the hobby. Just to give you another idea of scale, for instance. <laughs> and some people in the back. And that's all hand-painted, all put together, bit by bit. And that's the sort of thing you live for. So, a little bit of history about the fiction in Warhammer, uh, Warhammer 40K. First and foremost, if you're part of the human army, you're part of the Imperial Guard, the pay is lousy, the battles are fierce, and you might <laughs> never see home again, but hey, they did give you a laser gun. <laughs> it's a really brutal life to live, and it's definitely not one that I don't think anyone would want to have in real life. Uh, so, essentially, Mankind is ha has uh, an empire that's spanning the stars. So they come up with this brilliant idea of, well, there's all these horrible things that want to eat us in the galaxy. We should probably make, I don't know, super soldiers to, I don't know, fight these evil things that are probably going to eat us if we don't. So they've created the Space Marine, which essentially is this concept of a human that's been genetically altered to be eight feet to 10 feet tall. They have two hearts, you know, in case one gets ripped out two sets of lungs, and for those who love this next little bit, they have the ability to spit acid. <laughs> Very great. So they look human, but they really aren't, essentially. They're as far gone as it can be. However, space marines, they are very important for the foundation of Warhammer 40K. They drive a lot of the narrative plots of the story, and it's a great thing for authors to be able to compare and contrast them, because they're not, they're not human. They are something else entirely. But yet they still have to interact with humans and protect them. And there's lots of situations where space marines don't necessarily agree with that philosophy and they fight other space marines. So there's a lot of interesting conflicts and contrasting. Now, during the time in the 90s, Games Workshop was a pretty prolific company. They wanted to make video games, computer games based on their intellectual property. There's this one particular North American-based company that they were going to release with. However, they changed their minds at the last minute they lost a little bit of their copyright, so they kind of pulled out of the, the agreement. But I would say that they kind of missed the boat because the games and the company they uh, walked away from were Blizzard Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And Blizzard took a lot of the intellectual IP, changed it a little bit, and created Warcraft and Starcraft. And if you know anything about online games, you'll know that those are some of the biggest franchises in the market at the moment that have changed the world. Uh, then we have, of course, famous author, Dan Abnett. I had a chance to meet him, actually. He was in Chestermere in 2012. Came for, uh, uh, for an author uh, interview, and he wrote quite a bit for Guardians of the Galaxy. He's kind of the reason why Guardians of the Galaxy, the version you see on film, is pretty amazing. It's because of this guy. And why is he important? Well, he wrote most of the core fiction of Warhammer 40,000. So, Basically, if you love detective stories and science fiction in outer space, trying to uncover a secret conspiracy plot, I highly recommend Eisenhorn. For those who want to see more space marines fighting other space marines because of ideological differences, Horus Rising, which is the start of Horus Heresy, is an awesome entry point. I highly recommend both of them, even if you don't like Warhammer 40K, they're just great novels in general. And people love to paint minis. And this is an example of someone painting for a competition $10,000 prize, 
and this is the winner of this year's Adepticon. Is that Vladimir Putin? No. <laughs> it, looks, it looks very similar to Daniel Craig, actually. Yeah. I don't know what's up. <laughs> so, next we have the next biggest company in the industry. We have Privateer Press, who is, uh, oh, <laughs> as I get close to the end here. Privateer, it's pretty influential. They create a lot of games like War Machine Hordes, etc. But for the most part, their minis, while they're fantastic, they wanted to come up with a movie franchise, but it kind of fell through, but the IP went around still, and they ended up missing out on uh, Monster Apocalypse, which eventually became Pacific Rim. And Fantasy Flight Games, fantastic company, does Star Wars intellectual property, cool mini or not, for their board game slash miniature game hybrids. And uh, we have a huge industry with Kickstarter. There's new miniature games coming out every month or so, and uh, it's the golden age for this hobby. So if this interested you at all in any way, make sure to go check it out. It's, uh, you won't definitely be disappointed.